Hey, everybody. Glad you're back for the exciting conclusion of our chapter 10 and 11 notes. Talking about evolution, in case you forgot. So we're going to hop right back to it. Let me start presenting my screen. Here's the part where I complain about the Chromebook being slow. I know how much you probably enjoy that. And here's where we left off. So now if we want to talk about some other ways, maybe in other ways, but yeah, ways the populations can change over time. Um, there's three types of selection that can occur. And if you look at this diagram here, the top gray curves are, call, are called normal distribution curves, where the number of individuals is on the y-axis, and then there's some variation of a trait on the x-axis. So you can imagine human height, for example. Well, very, very few humans are four feet tall as adults. More and more humans are five feet, five foot three, five foot four. Right here at the tippy top, well, that's most people, let's say, are five foot nine. And then there's less people that are six three, very few people who are seven foot five. So here's a whole range of heights. And the, the height of the curve here uh, is how many individuals have that height. And this could be like the greenness of a bug, you know, where very few of the bugs are here at the left are dark green. Most of them here in the middle are medium green and very, very few here at the end are bright green. So something like that. This is a normal distribution curve. And the black arrows represent who's being selected against, like who's at the disadvantage. And then the bottom is what happens. So the blue curve is the result of this type of selection over some period of time. It could be thousands of years. It could be millions of years. So the first one is called directional selection. This is where one of the two extremes of the trait uh, gets selected against, that it's a disadvantage to have that. So let's say this is a normal distribution here of we'll use our giraffe neck length. So very few giraffes have a really short neck. Most have an average length neck and a few have an exceptionally long neck. Well, let's say that there's some selection against the ones with short necks, AKA getting enough food. Remember they eat leaves. All the low leaves get eaten by everybody. But again, there's not enough food for, for all the giraffes. And so the ones that can reach highest on the trees are at the advantage. So these short ones, a lot of them starve to death. They don't pass on their short neck genes. Notice how the shift here was in one direction, in this case to the right. Over time, longer necks were favored. And so we see now that, whereas let's just make up numbers, that the average giraffe had a six-foot neck. After 150,000 years, the average giraffe now has a six and a half foot neck. And this could continue, maybe. So directional selection, the, the curve, the population shifts in one direction, and it could be the other. It could be that having too long a neck was a disadvantage. And I might use that in a later example. The one in the middle is called stabilizing selection. And this is when both extremes are selected against. In other words, it's good to be normal, or it's, I should say it's good to be average. It's good to be average here. So let's again use our giraffes. It's still bad to have a short neck. Remember what I was just saying, maybe having an extremely long neck isn't good because you can't hold it up off the ground. It's Your neck's too long and your head just flops onto the ground. Uh, you're dragging your head behind you when you try to walk because of your super long neck. Or maybe more realistically, it's too hard to pump blood up that high from the heart. Giraffes have enormous hearts, by the way. 
And I don't mean emotionally. Um, they probably are pretty sensitive too. Um, but just physiologically, they have huge hearts to pump that blood up their, up their necks to their brains. But let's say there's a limit on that. And so it's bad to have a real short neck because you're starved to death. And it's bad to have a real long neck because you can't supply oxygen to your brain. So look what happens over time. With both extremes being selected against, it's not that the extremes turn into the intermediates. It's that more intermediates survive because they're well-fed and their brains get enough blood. And so you're going to see that the diversity, the, the range of this neck length trait, kind of the curve skinnies up. It becomes more like the, the middle average trait which again, let's say was uh, six foot necks. The last one's disruptive selection. And this is the opposite really of stabilizing. Here, it's bad to be average. Both extremes are favored. For this example, I like to use the length of an adult fish. Um, let's say that, you know, you could be small as an adult, medium sized or big. And let's say there's a predator that attacks and eats this population of fish. Well, the little ones survive better because they are able to hide in all the little nooks and crannies of where these fish all live. And the big ones live okay because, well, they're too big to eat. The predator can't fit them in, in its mouth. And so they, they wind up surviving. But if you're a medium sized fish in this example, well, you're too big to hide but you still fit in the predator's mouth. So you're at the disadvantage. And you can see here how the curve over time sort of splits a little bit. You're going to see over time that there's less intermediate average adult fish, more that are either big or on the smaller side. And that's called disruptive because it's kind of disrupting the population into two separate groups. Now, if you had to guess of the three, which one is more likely to lead to a new species forming? All of them can, by the way, under certain conditions, but which one do you think is most likely to? Wait, what? Yes, disruptive selection for sure. Good. All right, a couple more ways that populations can change. Gene flow, think immigration and emigration. Okay, so organisms entering a new population, they are immigrating into the new population. And when they leave a population, they are emigrating. So this RNG beetle, I guess it looks kind of brown on my screen, has emigrated from this population and it's immigrating into the green population. And guess what? It's taken its genes with it. So these are all members of the same species, but they were different populations that in this case had different coloration. So when this, I'm going to call it orange, orange beetle comes into the green population, starts reproducing, it's going to be passing on this orange gene to its offspring. Now, there could be incomplete dominance where orange and green are going to blend and to make some, you know, intermediate color. Or maybe just as before, 100% of the population was green, well, now maybe it's going to be 80% green, 20% orange. So that population has changed over time. The gene pool, uh, which is all the genes that, that make up a species, uh, it's, it's gene, genome, or we could say the gene pool, all the, all the uh, genes that are available to be passed on has changed over time due to gene flow. Another phrase here, genetic drift, actually has two examples or two subparts to it. Um, genetic drift is made up of the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. In both cases, you have very large reductions in the size of the population. With the bottleneck effect, it's a massive kill-off of some kind, a die-off. So in this bottle, there's red and white marbles, about 50-50, uh, or the same amount of each, and then very few green ones. Well, the bottleneck is the, is the kill off. Let's say that the, 
I don't know, you could think meteor hits the earth, changes global conditions drastically, only a few survive randomly. Um, or it doesn't even have to be as extreme as that. It could be, um, you know, locally, a, a hurricane comes through an area and most of the ants are killed in that area due to all the flooding and the winds and the damage. So look who survives. Mostly reds, one white, and none of the greens. So whereas before maybe it was, you know, 49% red, 49% white, 2% green. Well, now it's 95% red, 5% white, 0% green. So this bottleneck effect due to the lower numbers just caused a drastic change in the genetics of that population. Now the founder effect is similar, but there's no kill off. Rather what happens is a subset of the main population finds itself in a new location and basically repopulates it. So we can imagine this is a, a mainland where I don't know, there's these birds and some are red, some are blue, they're the same species. And these islands to the right are too far for the birds to fly normally. But maybe there was a storm one, one time and, and the winds were, were so strong and sustained that these little groupings of birds were able to make it to these islands. Well, if it was 50-50 red to blue on the mainland and only a bunch of red ones make it to this island, well, it went from 50% red now to 100% red. Same thing if only blue ones happen to make it. It's, it could be, too, that about 50-50 make it to this island and then the allele, the, the gene frequencies didn't really change. But again, since it's random, you can get changes in populations due to founder effect, just like you can the bottleneck effect. Both of these are under the umbrella of what we call genetic drift. Here we have sexual selection. So here's a peacock. Here's a peahen. Females are called peahens. And the females are a little bit drab. Don't have the big bright plumage that the males have. Um, love that bright blue color on, on, on peacocks. Um, but listen, peacocks are eaten by predators. And certainly having these big, huge, bright feathers uh, is not an advantage when it comes to hiding from, from predators. What we think is going on with peacocks and peahens is females are choosy. Um, they want to mate with the genetically best of the, or, or the males that have the best genetics so that their offspring have the best chance to survive. And the assumption here is, wow, if this, if this male has these huge bright feathers, number one, he must be healthy. He must be good at finding enough food to produce these big bright feathers. Number two, he must be kind of smart, strong, fast, because even with these big, huge bright feathers, he's been able to get away from predators his whole life. So the assumption is, wow, he must be genetically pretty strong. I'm going to mate with him. Because don't forget, when we learned about meiosis, I told you this story about how with oogenesis making eggs, how females produce one egg and the other three polar bodies sacrifice themselves for the chosen egg cell. Whereas in males, all four become sperm cells. And I told you then that we see this female, well, female care in reproduction because in most species, females produce the offspring, which she requires more nutrients to do that. She's more vulnerable to predators during the process. And males and females both want to play the game of life, right? They want to pass their genes on. So since females invest more in the process, they tend to be choosier. Whereas in a lot of species, the male strategy is just to mate with as many females as possible and hope that, yeah, hopefully some of my offspring will carry on my genes and then I've won the game of life. So we see here with this sexual selection that the peahens select males with the biggest, brightest feathers because, again, they want to make sure that their reproductive efforts aren't in vain. So that is sexual selection.
So just to recap, these are factors that can lead to evolution. Uh, we just spoke of genetic drift. That was with founder effect and bottleneck effect. Gene flow was the immigration of organisms from one population into another. Sexual selection we just discussed. Uh, mutation happens, right? That's going to change genes and that's going to lead to slightly different traits. And we started all this off with natural selection, uh, how the environment sort of, quote, selects or chooses which individuals are best suited for survival. And then those genes will get passed on that made them successful. And so all these are things that lead species or populations to change or evolve over time. Now, two scientists developed a way to measure, calculate, and predict allele frequency changes in populations. So their last names were Hardy and Weinberg. Um, and so a couple of things. The term allele is like a synonym for a gene. I could talk about the blue eye gene or the blue eye allele. Okay, so allele and gene, same thing. And the frequency is how common that gene is in the population. Now, I'm not talking about the trait. Remember, every trait, there's two genes that make a trait, right? That's You get one from mom, one from dad. So it's not the traits that we're looking at, but the actual genes. So even though an individual has brown eyes, well, that could be one brown eye gene and one blue eye gene. Or it could be two brown eye genes. Allele frequencies are how common the gene is in the population. And so their equation is rather simple. P plus Q equals 1. P is the frequency of the dominant allele. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. If you add them up, they equal 1 or 100%. Now, if you square both sides, you get P squared plus 2P cubed plus Q squared. Remember that FOIL thing that your math teacher bored you with? And if you square one, well, that stays one on the right. What these terms then represent really are homozygous dominant individuals, heterozygous individuals, and homozygous recessive individuals. And so again, Hardy Weinberg predicts that if these five assumptions are met, that a population will be in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium and will not be evolving. Now think about what that means. When a population evolves, the allele frequencies change, right? We looked into, say, the, the founder effect. You know, the frequency of the red gene in the bird population went from 50%, maybe to 90 or 100%. That's an allele frequency change. That's evolution. And so look at the assumptions. Barney Weinberg says for populations to not be evolving, population has to be big. If a million is good, 100 million is better. You can have no immigration or emigration. Organisms cannot go between populations. They have to stay in the group that they're in. Forget mutation. You can't have any mutation occur. Mating is random, so none of that peacock, peahen stuff. And no natural selection, so forget what... Charles Darwin said, every individual has an equal chance to survive no matter what its genes and its traits are. Now that seems strange because when are you ever going to find a real world population that meets all five of these criteria? Well, the answer is probably never. But look back here at what the drivers of it are. Genetic drift. Well, genetic drift, remember you were left with a small population on the island or only a small population survived. So large populations counters that one. Gene flow, immigration and emigration, right? So this, this assumption here is saying no gene flow. Mutation was on the list, so no mutation. Sexual selection was on the list. Well, that's why we're saying now random mating. A natural selection can have that. So basically, Hardy Weinberg said, for a population to not be evolving, none of the drivers of evolution can occur. 
Well, duh, right? I mean, that's, of course. But what this does, and again, we won't really use these with real numbers or anything. Um, in AP Bio, we, we, we deal with this more. Um, but basically what this does is it allows scientists to measure allele frequencies in a population and then to monitor over time how those allele frequencies change if they do or not. If they do, well, now we can look at what assumptions were being broken, what conditions weren't being met. Maybe these organisms do have a lot of immigration between populations. Uh, maybe they have an exceptionally high mutation rate. Maybe there is sexual selection going on. Or maybe there's some factor in the environment uh, that's, that's, that's shaping this, this population, causing it to change over time. So again, the Hardy-Weinberg equations, it's a way to calculate and to monitor allele frequencies and how they might change in a population over time. All right, so kind of a new concept here, speciation, process of forming new species. So believe it or not, it's very difficult to define what constitutes a species. Um, without going into a whole long story, which in class I might have done, I'll boil it down and say to you that if two individuals can make offspring together, and if those offspring can have babies of their own, then those two individuals were part of the same species. In other words, they were able to make fertile offspring, babies that can have their own babies. If they can't, then no matter how similar they might seem, they are members of different species. So it all comes down to whether individuals can mate successfully and make fertile offspring. Now, there's exceptions to this. Um, you know, dogs and wolves can produce little, little whoopies. They're not really called that. Um, but they can form fertile offspring. But there's another kind of exception to this rule that if, well, even if species, or excuse me, individuals can make fertile offspring, if they don't do it normally in nature, we'll still consider them separate. And this idea of a species breaks down. What if, what if we're talking a unicellular organism, you know, like an amoeba uh, that reproduces asexually, right? Where one cell just splits into two. So it actually is very difficult to define a species, but we're going to go with the producing fertile offspring thing. And the way we get new species is through various isolating mechanisms. Now, guys, basically, you've got to take members of a population and you've got to get them reproducing separately from each other so that each group develops different genetic differences than the other group. With mating, it's got to be Goldilocks, right? The, the genetics have to be just right. That's why cats and dogs can't make that's so the genetics if they're too different you can't make offspring so members of a single species at first can all interbreed you've got to somehow get members reproducing separately from each other so that they can basically develop different mutations different genetic differences until the genetics are no longer goldilocks now, the first isolating mechanism to achieve that is, I think, the most easy to understand or the easiest to understand. It's called geographic isolation. So let's say you have a population of wild boar that can all reproduce together, and they live throughout a mountainous area. And then there's an earthquake, and a huge mountain collapses, and there's this deep gorge that separates two halves of the population. Well, now they're physically separated from each other. And maybe on one side of this gorge, the environmental conditions are very different. It's on the, the, the windward side. It's, it's, you know, maybe drier. Um, maybe there's a predator there that isn't on the other side. So for various reasons, different mutations, um, different natural selective pressures, the two groups are going to start becoming different over time. Maybe in 800,000 years, um, there's another earthquake that fills in the gorge 
and they can get to each other again. Well, if they've become so genetically different over those 800,000 years that they can no longer interbreed, we just had speciation occur. Two separate species from one original through geographic isolation. Now, the other ones are similar, but all the organisms are still living amongst each other. So it's a little bit weirder to think about. With behavioral, think of mating dances. So certain birds like to do mating dances to attract mates. And let's say there's a male that does a little hoppy dance, hops up and down to impress the female birds. And there's certain females that love a little hoppy up and down dance. Well, they're going to mate with each other. Other males do a little spinny dance. They don't do the hop thing. They do a little spinning. And there's females that love the spinny dance. And so they're going to mate just amongst themselves. Well, even though all these birds are in the same area and they're all the same species, do you see that they are isolated? Because in this case, there's a difference in the behavior, the mating dance that certain males do and certain females prefer. Fast forward that a million years or less or more, who knows? The two groups might become genetically different enough that they can no longer interbreed, even if they tried. In that case, we'd say speciation has occurred due to behavioral isolation. Temporal means time. So certain males and females in a population might reproduce only in the spring. Others might reproduce together only in the fall. So now you got the spring doers and the fall doers differing in when they reproduce. And it's possible the two groups could develop different genetic differences, which over a million years or so might make it so they can no longer interbreed, even if they tried. In this case, we'd say speciation has occurred due to temporal isolation. And reproductive isolation is more or less a, a physical, sexual anatomy thing. Certain males and females have anatomy that fits better uh, to deliver a sperm to an egg cell, and other males and females have anatomy that jives better. Here they are separated due to this reproductive isolation, could lead to speciation down the road. So there was a common denominator there, right? A refrain to the song. Members of the same species at first can interbreed, somehow isolated two groups develop enough genetic differences that they can no longer interbreed speciation. All right, home stretch. The idea of coevolution is when two species evolve in response to each other. Um, you could imagine scenarios where um, cheetahs are fast and the animals that they hunt uh, there's, there's that selective pressure to be faster. And so maybe some individuals then through natural selection become faster. And so in response, the fastest cheetahs are selected for, um, it could be that organisms to survive, learn how to climb higher than, and better than cheetahs can, even though they can climb too. So then cheetahs develop longer claws so that they can make their way up the tree to get to these prey uh, species. In this picture here, we have the casea tree, these thorns. Um, there's a certain species of ant that hollow, that bites into and hollows out these thorns and they they live in there. That's their habitat. And in, re in return, what happens is the ants protect the tree from herbivores that are going to want to eat all the leaves and potentially kill the tree. So this is like a little win-win situation. We're going to talk about mutualism later in the course. But here the tree evolved to have these horns, these thorns that the ants can hollow out. And in response, the ants have evolved to live in these thorns and to, to defend their territory. And so this co-evolution occurred over time where these two species now have a very intertwined relationship with each other. All right, and finally, we could talk about the pace of evolution, punctuated equilibrium versus gradualism. So gradualism is what the name implies. You have a slow, steady 
gradual um, sequence of changes that occur, slow and steady, and eventually you get different species evolving from an original, perhaps. With punctuated equilibrium, we have periods of little or no change, and then bam, a burst of evolution. And so we call those bursts of evolution adaptive radiations. And then there's periods of little or no change, and then bang, another burst of evolution, another adaptive radiation. So it's equilibrium, periods of little or no change, that are punctuated by bursts of evolution. Now the fossil record is, in the fossil record we find evidence for both. Different periods of time in different places on the planet, we see that both uh, gradualism and punctuated equilibrium have occurred. Question, which type do you think happens uh, in areas where the conditions are very stable that change very, very slowly over super long periods of time? Gradualism. Right. Punctuated equilibrium the environment's probably pretty stable until that adaptive radiation. And then maybe it's like a meteor collision. Crazy, radical changes in the fossil record. And then we see the same fossils, the same fossils, the same fossils. And then bang, maybe there was a, you know, an ice age or something that occurred. And we see all kinds of different organisms than we did uh, in, in the layers before. So, yeah, a, a more... Stable environment tends to lead to a gradualism type of pace of evolution, whereas a more, let's say, eventful environment with more drastic, radical, quick changes causes these punctuated equilibrium, these adaptive radiations. All right, so that takes us through our chapter 10, 11 notes. Um, Guys, if you have any questions about any of this, you want to get, hop on Google Meet, talk about it some more, um, or email me, and I can I'll get back to you. Obviously, um, please don't hesitate. You know th this is crazy enough with with trying to learn the way we are. Um, hopefully, these videos are helpful. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out if you're having any problem, any problem completing any assignment. Um, completing it on time. If there's issues, just reach out. I mean, I, I, I know, you know, some people have, have some things going on that make it very difficult for them to do things uh, in as timely a fashion as maybe I think that, that you should be able to. Um, just know that I'm here for you um, and I will see you next time.